Thank you uh, again to Tricia and Tawny for, uh, it takes a lot of courage to get up on a stage in front of a lot of people and it's not what you normally do and we really appreciate them sharing their, their personal experiences with us. Um, we're now moving on to our next talk on uh, expanding the limits of liver transplant candidacy. Alcoholic liver disease is a common cause of cirrhosis and may be complicated by hepatocellular carcinoma. Dr. John Rice will present to us on the changes, on the changes in the liver transplant candidate selection criteria for these diagnoses. Dr. Rice is an assistant professor of medicine, director of hepatology, and medical director of the Liver and Pancreas Center at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. His clinical interests include gastroenterology, hepatology, and liver transplantation, and his research focus includes hepatitis C and liver transplantation. Please welcome Dr. John Rice. Thank you. I have to say that's going to be a tough act to follow, uh, so uh, you may want to lower your expectations a little bit from that last, uh, last talk from our donor and recipient pair to my talk here. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about expanding the limits of liver transplant candidacy. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so my objectives for this talk are to summarize the medical evidence um, for six months sobriety and, uh, and a long-term risk of alcohol relapse after transplantation, um, and to discuss the evidence supporting uh, rescue transplantation in selected patients with alcoholic hepatitis in short-term sobriety. Uh, changing focus then a little bit, we'll go to uh, reviewing the strategy of the quote-unquote ablate and wait in selecting patients with liver, for liver transplantation outside of the traditional Milan criteria. Um, and then some of the changes that have happened on a national basis uh, with UNOS as far as uh, meld point allocation in patients with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So if we look at the basics of liver transplantation, is that transplantation is the only life-saving treatment for patients with end-stage liver disease and uh, uh, certain tumors. Uh, when I say certain tumors, I mean hepatocellular carcinoma, where it's unlikely uh, that we can offer any sort of curative therapy uh, short of liver transplantation. Uh, the outcomes after liver transplantation are generally excellent. But unfortunately, we have many more potential liver transplant recipients than we have available donors. Every program in the country strives to maximize the utility of a donor organ. So we want to maximize the utility of those organs. Uh, and a lot of that comes to selecting good recipients. They have to have a good prognosis from their primary disease. Okay, so transplanting people who have uh, a disease that's not likely cured by liver transplant or has a high risk of returning after liver transplant, um, especially in the short term, is not a good transplant candidate. Uh, we want recipients who lack other comorbidities, so we don't want serious other comorbidities that lead to uh, a high risk of death otherwise. And then the psychosocial makeup to uh, care for the liver transplant. So you've got to take medicines, got to get your blood drawn, got to come to clinic. For people who do all those things and meet all those criteria, the outcomes are excellent. So we'll talk a little bit here about alcoholic liver disease. So just a little bit of a, uh, an overview of alcohol in the United States. Uh, about 50% of the population over the age of 12 drinks alcohol, which roughly uh, correlates to about 129 million people. This is a little bit of an old slide, so maybe a little bit more now. About a quarter of the population will report that they binge drank in the previous 30 days. And about 7% quoted themselves as a heavy drinker. Um, alcohol dependence um, is actually physical addiction to alcohol, so people who wake up and have withdrawal symptoms if they don't drink. And the risk factors for that are uh, males, uh, people at younger age, those of low, lower socioeconomic status, those who suffered uh, or underwent combat military deployment, uh, and then white or Native American ethnicity. Just some uh, definitions so you're aware of. Alcohol abuse is basically drinking to the point that you caught yourself, cause yourself problems. That can be problems legally, problems socially, uh, and then recurrent use despite those troubles. Alcohol dependence is basically alcohol abuse uh, plus the uh, development of physical addiction uh, to uh, uh, alcohol and the development of tolerance. We are in Wisconsin, and I don't think that you can mention alcohol and not bring up the special case of Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin uh, is the heaviest drinking state in the country, uh, and by, somewhat by a long shot. Uh, people not only drink alcohol more frequently in Wisconsin, they abuse alcohol more frequently in Wisconsin. Uh, 
As you can see, here's a map of patients reporting binge drinking in the past month. This is an, uh, an older study from 2007. But as you can see here, Wisconsin, numero uno. So number one in the country in terms of binge drinking in the United States. This was something from the lay press that was just a couple of weeks ago. This is from the Minnesota uh, the, the, uh, Star Tribune. Uh, and this was a, it was a, a more of a media study, so it wasn't really a, a scientifically rigorous study, but their conclusion was that 12 of the 20 drunkest cities in the United States reside in Wisconsin. Anyone know what number one was? Appleton. So you guys have all seen this article before. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, so this is an environment where we have a unique relationship with alcohol, and we're more likely to see alcoholic liver disease. It is sort of an enriched population. Uh, a minority of patients will, with an alcohol use disorder will develop cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease. Uh, generally, you need to drink in excess of 30 grams of alcohol per day. Uh, most will not develop cirrhosis or alcoholic hepatitis. 1% of those that drink 30 to 60 grams of alcohol per day, uh, that's anywhere between, say, two and five drinks, uh, will develop uh, cirrhosis or alcoholic hepatitis, and about 6% of those that drink 60 grams or more per day. So it is definitely the minority of patients that will develop cirrhosis. Uh, liver disease, like all liver diseases, have a variable presentation. Uh, many patients are asymptomatic, meaning they just have hepatic steatosis, which is fatty liver, um, or they can have cirrhosis, even to the point of cirrhosis, and have no symptoms. But eventually, if the liver damage continues, they'll develop portal hypertension and risk liver failure, and they'll develop decompensated cirrhosis. And a unique presentation is alcoholic hepatitis, which is a very severe illness uh, characterized by jaundice, ascites, encephalopathy, and the risk of renal failure. And that disease actually has a very high short-term mortality of severe. Um, when liver transplantation uh, was in its infancy, um, alcohol was not considered an indication for uh, transplant, alcoholic liver disease. Uh, the concern was the risk of relapse, the risk of recurrent disease, and that was a is, remains a legitimate concern. However, we do know uh, that patients who are transplanted for alcoholic liver disease do excellent. Um, it is the second most common cause now uh, for liver transplant worldwide. Uh, but we also know that up to 95% of people with alcoholic liver disease are never even evaluated for transplant, so they never even make it through the front door. Uh, liver transplant outcomes for alcoholic liver disease, though, are comparable to non-alcoholic uh, non indications for liver transplant. And this is an older study, uh, and it's a little bit of a complicated slide here, uh, but you can see here that um, for patients with alcoholic disease versus no alcoholic liver disease, so that's alcohol versus any other indication, there was no difference in outcome uh, in terms of post-transplant mortality. As this is always brought up and is an important point. It's a little bit different now that we have effective treatments for hepatitis C, but the presence of hepatitis C dramatically decreased uh, the outcome after transplant. So people with hepatitis C were more likely to lose their allograft and die. And those of us who worked in transplant were well aware of that, that hepatitis C was a real problem post-transplant. With new effective antiviral medication, that's going to become less and less of an issue. So those of you uh, in the transplant world may be familiar with the six-month rule. So the six-month rule is a rule that is oftentimes uh, implemented by liver transplant programs and then also payers for liver transplant saying that you need to have six months of sustained sobriety before being considered for liver transplant. Um, why is that? Well, one is that liver transplantation does nothing to treat alcohol dependence. And whenever I see a patient with alcoholic liver disease, um, I make a point to point out you're technically dying of alcoholism. It just the liver was the, what happened to go first. So you're really dying of an addiction to alcohol. Okay? So that's one reason why. They're saying that if you're not sober, then what's the point of doing a liver transplant? And that's a completely legitimate argument. The second reason is, is the liver may dramatically recover with time. I have had the experience of sending people out on hospice um, with severe decompensated alcoholic liver disease only to have them stroll into clinic a year later uh, with totally normal liver tests and the, and the complications of portal hypertension have resolved. So it can dramatically recover with abstinence and time and obviate the need for a liver transplant altogether. The way the six months transplant or the six month rule is oftentimes used though is as a surrogate for future sobriety. Uh, and that's why a lot of programs use it. Now that's a life and death assumption. So you're basically saying that this person is going to drink again because they haven't been sober for six months. The question we oftentimes ask ourselves, though, is does abstinence and counseling while someone is dying really impact future sobriety? And the answer to that is that the evidence for that is very limited. 
Okay, so if, again, if you see somebody who's jaundiced, who's getting ascites tapped once a week, who's encephalopathic, and then say, well, you need to go to counseling and be sober for six months, and they somehow find a way to do that, is that really going to impact their long-term ability to stay away from alcohol? If they just kind of jump through those hoops. So this has been studied a little bit before, and six months of sobriety before transplant has at best been a week and oftentimes not predictive of future, predictive of future alcohol relapse. And a detailed psychosocial risk of the risk factors that we know about as a risk factor for future relapse is much more predictive. And you can see that list on the right here, uh, predictors of relapse. And these are things that are probably very common sense to you, uh, but they're important when it comes to the risk of future relapse. So people who have a you know, negative mood, untreated mood disorders, uh, people with poor social and coping skills, um, and a whole laundry list of things here that probably don't surprise you. Uh, as risk factors for future uh, drinking after liver transplant. So what happens to people who tra after they transplanted? Well, unfortunately, alcoholism is a disease uh, that is relapsing. Uh, and numerous studies have been done on the risk of relapse post-transplant. And the relapse rate runs from about 10% to up to 50%. The best study is probably performed in Pittsburgh, uh, where Demartini uh, published their result, where they followed this uh, group of alcoholics who were transplanted prospectively. And they found that 46% relapsed to some alcohol, but most of those patients drank infrequently. Uh, about 20% drank in a potentially abusive manner. Uh, and there were really five characteristics that they found. Uh, one group was the group who never drank. Uh, the second one was a group who drank very infrequently. Uh, and then there were three groups who drank potentially abusively, uh, one of which was a group who drank very heavily immediately after transplant, and those were the ones who potentially did the worst. There's a second group who resumed moderate alcohol use after transplant, but then uh, uh, basically went back to sobriety again. And there was a group who stayed sober for a while after transplant, but then began drinking several years after transplant was, uh, was done. The one question we never really had a question was, is how does the, these relapses affect transplantation? And I think one of the things we're trying to move towards in the field of liver transplantation is to move away from the idea that a relapse is necessarily unexpected or considered to be a failure of transplantation. But what we do realize is that people who drink heavily, continue to drink heavily, don't get back into treatment and don't take care of themselves from an alcohol perspective, definitely do worse. And this is some data that we published from UW uh, back in 2013 looking at the impact of post-transplant relapse. Uh, and this is a, a survival analysis of patients who drank heavily uh, versus no alcohol, heavy alcohol recurrence. So this includes patients who did drink, but not ones who drank very heavily after transplant. As you can see, uh, survival is impacted by people who drink heavily after transplant. However, it's relatively uncommon. In this particular study, we found 16 people who drank very heavily in a really continuous manner after transplant. Uh, compare that to 284 uh, who did not. We also found, though, that heavy drinking leads to fibrosis. So this first graph was talking about survival and death, but the other thing we're worried about is recurrent allograft damage. And one of the things we looked at was comparing people who relapsed versus people who didn't relapse and look at liver biopsies that were done. And as you can see, the most important slide here is that advanced fibrosis, meaning a lot of scar tissue in the allograft, risking allograft failure. They haven't had allograft failure. They're not dying but they were much more likely to have advanced fibrosis stage three or more than people who relapse. So we know that alcohol relapse is a problem, particularly in people who drink heavily after transplant, and you can risk hurting the allograft. The other thing we didn't talk about, and this has been done in other studies as well, is that it's likely the allograft is not um, as tolerant of alcohol abuse as the native liver. So people are oftentimes find themselves getting advanced fibrosis with uh, less total amounts of drinking uh, than they experienced before transplant. So to summarize so far, alcoholic liver disease is very common. It will likely remain a common etiology of liver transplantation. Every patient, no matter how long they've been sober before transplant, is uh, at risk of relapse and require an ongoing assessment. Um, many patients with alcoholic liver disease will not have many years of sobriety. So if you look at the non-transplant literature, it usually takes about five years of sustained sobriety before somebody really is at low risk of relapse. Most patients with alcoholic liver disease are not going to have that amount of sobriety before transplantation. Most patients won't relapse after transplant. So in most studies, anywhere between 10 to 20% drink potentially abusively, with a few more having the occasional drink after that. But we do know that heavy, or heavy use can lead to allograft loss. 
And finally, six months sobriety is a poor predictor overall of future relapse risk. So this brings us to the topic of transplantation for alcoholic hepatitis. This is a controversial topic in transplantation. Alcoholic state of hepatitis is characterized by typically very heavy recent alcohol use. So this is not a disease of somebody drinking two beers. You know, this is somebody who's really putting it away pretty heavy. Uh, it oftentimes goes along with malnourishment uh, due to poor, uh, poor eating while they're drinking so much. There's severe fatty infiltration of the biopsy. They oftentimes have anorexia, fevers, uh, leukocytosis, and terrible portal hypertension leading to kidney failure. Uh, it is a severe illness, and frequently these patients require hospitalization, and there's a high short-term mortality if it's severe. So there's a, something called a matter discriminant function, which is a calculation based on the degree of liver failure. Uh, and it, if it's, the value is greater than 32, it predicts a high short-term mortality, uh, and a 25 to 35% mortality at one month. So how do we treat alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis? Well, the first thing, obviously, is sort of a duh statement. Uh, abstinence. So again, as I mentioned before, the liver can dramatically recover with alcohol abstinence. Nutrition, we frequently have to force feed people. They don't have an appetite because their liver is so inflamed uh, to try to get their uh, nutritional status improved. And for severe alcoholic hepatitis, um, we use corticosteroids, uh, typically prednisolone, 40 milligrams a day or equivalent, and we taper it over 28 days for those that respond. And for those that respond, there's a decreased risk of mortality. You begin to see the liver improve. An older therapy was pentoxyphilin that's generally fallen out of favor, uh, generally felt to be ineffective at this point. And then N-acetylcysteine has been used in one study that showed an increase in pro uh, survival at one month, but no different at three months. I would point out that the p-value of 0.06 suggests that if they had had a few more patients, they might have had a statistically significant result. So the problem of alcoholic hepatitis is that it's a high mortality rate is, is severe in the failed steroids. So if you fail medical management, your risk of dying is pretty, pretty high. Uh, typically, it's very heavy antecedent alcohol use. So it's oftentimes seen in patients with severe alcohol use disorders. Some patients will recover. So there's, we don't have a, a perfect predictor. Even patients who fail steroids, some people will begin to recover. But due to the above reasons and the, unlikely, and the low likelihood that people will survive with severe alcoholic hepatitis who failed steroids, um, transplant programs have traditionally been reticent to consider these patients for transplant because of all these reasons. But now there's been a little bit of a frame shift in recent years. And that really started in 2011 with this study from France. And this was a multi-center study where they transplanted selected patients for alcoholic, severe alcoholic hepatitis that failed medical management. Uh, over the course of the study, which was over several years, uh, they ultimately transplanted 26 patients. That was only 2% of the ultimate population that actually presented with, with uh, alcoholic hepatitis. So it was a very small number. They all had a favorable psychosocial profile. And as you can see here, the survival uh, of the patients that are going transplantation was comparable to those that responded to steroids, so responded to medical management. For those that failed treatment, uh, their survival was only 30% at six months. They did note that three patients did return to drinking after their transplantation, but three out of 26 is a fairly low number, uh, and they felt that uh, it warranted continued watching, but felt that these patients overall did very well. So at UW, we have been occasionally transplanting patients with alcoholic liver disease in short-term sobriety. Uh, we take a, a multidisciplinary approach to risk stratification, looking at such factors as insight to addiction, what sort of support the uh, patients with alcoholic liver disease have otherwise, do they have substitute activities like employment or hobbies, previous consequences of alcohol addiction. As I say, past behavior is the best indication of uh, future behavior, and patients who've lost everything because of alcohol um, are less likely uh, to uh, maintain sobriety after transplant. I mean, what's the transplant going to make different? Uh, and then multiply failed pr uh, previous treatment, of tr treatment attempts. And we looked at this, we looked at all the patients transplanted between, two, or evaluated for transplant between 2012 and 2014. Uh, we used our transplant database for this and then reviewed the charts for their psychosocial assessment and a review of their uh, history with alcohol. Over that three year span, we evaluated 232 patients with alcoholic liver disease. Um, they were split evenly, actually, between people who had less than six months sobriety and more than six months sobriety at the time of their initial evaluation. And as you can see, um, about 70 or so were approved in each arm, and about 40, 45 were uh, not approved in each arm. These are some of the reasons we denied people for transplant listing. Um, psychosocial and alcohol uh, addiction was common in both arms. Um, a number of them died during the evaluation, which gives you an idea of how sick these people are. 
Interestingly enough, and this is important, a certain proportion did improve, uh, and we stopped the transplant evaluation because they were getting better, and there's a few other reasons that you can see. I would also point out that patients who were not evaluated for transplant, so patients who were admitted to the hospital with severe alcohol liver disease, who were otherwise felt because of the surrounding situation not to be good transplant candidates by the consult team, these patients are not included in this. So there's a number of patients, uh, perhaps even more than the 200, who were never considered for transplantation at all. So these are our results. Uh, you can see here that we have listed 73 patients with less than six months uh, sobriety at evaluation. Uh, 56 of those ultimately underwent transplantation. Uh, 31 of them had mild enough liver disease at the time of their evaluation that they were able to undergo uh, six months of sobriety uh, and some alcohol rehabilitation. Uh, 25 patients were transplanted with less than six months of sobriety. Uh, on the other side, uh, we transplanted uh, 45 patients uh, with more than six months uh, sobriety at the time of both evaluation and transplant. Uh, and here's our results. Um, just a few things to point out. Uh, not surprisingly, those that transplanted less than six months had a higher MELD score of both their waitlisting and transplant. Again, these are people who are unlikely to survive, um, and so it's not surprising they have a higher MELD score. They're also much less likely to ha have uh, HCC as a diagnosis, which is not surprising either. Um, they have a fewer number of median days from their last drink to their liver transplant. As you can see here, only 43 days versus 281 versus uh, over 1,000. And then they're more likely to have steatohepatitis on explant. That's a marker for alcoholic hepatitis. So uh, here's the uh, results for the follow-up. Um, as you can see, these are all patients who survived a year. Uh, we've had alcohol relapse has been pretty consistent across the board. We've had about 20% of people at least relapse to some slip to alcohol uh, in their follow-up period. Uh, a minority of those, about half of them, we suspected that they had an allograft injury related to alcohol. Um, we had no alcohol-related deaths so far, but I would point out this is relatively short follow-up. Um, there was no difference in terms of patients being abstinent at last follow-up. A majority of patients by far were still abstinent at their last follow-up. And then any sort of biopsy features of alcohol liver disease were uncommon. However, um, take that with a grain of salt because most patients were not biopsied. When we split up uh, the patients who relapsed versus the patients who maintained abstinence after their transplant, you can see 19 relapsed and 72 remained abstinent. A six months abstinence and transplant was not uh, a predictive factor. What was predictive was the heaviest drinkers were more likely to drink after transplant. Uh, people who had gone through treatment and failed before, particularly multi multiple treatment uh, attempts. Um, and then drinking despite knowledge of having a liver disease. So being told they had a liver problem in the past and continuing to drink alcohol was also predictive of future relapse. The rest of these factors uh, were not uh, significant. Again, these are the univariate predictors of relapse. Interestingly, people who were interested in ongoing alcohol treatment were more likely to relapse. Uh, it's hard to say that having that, it just may reflect the severity of their addiction, uh, that they are interested in treatment, but just, just can't keep away from alcohol. So we conclude from this that six months sobriety is an insufficient predictor for alcohol relapse and that a multidisciplinary assessment is probably a better tool. Uh, one, it will not set both six months as some sort of like magic goal for patients, saying if I make it six months then they're gonna transplant me. Um, I think a bad candidate from a psychosocial candidate uh, standpoint is a bad candidate. And a good candidate's a good candidate. We shouldn't be using six months sobriety uh, as, a, as, a, as a surrogate for future relapse risk. Um, and I think that's an important thing because I think there are patients who otherwise would do well. I have several in my clinic um, who were, had less than six months who would have died um, otherwise, who are doing great, thriving, not drinking, productive, uh, and very grateful for the opportunity they were given. So where do you take this from here? Um, well, we still don't have a perfect tool, and I don't know if we'll ever have a perfect tool, but we need a better way to risk stratify people with, for uh, severe alcohol relapse after transplantation. We also need to get away from the idea that a relapse after transplantation is considered a, a failure. I don't think that's a failure. This is a relapsing disease, uh, but what we want for is people who are not going to damage their allografts and will get back into treatment and still fight for their sobriety long term. Um, <clears throat> we need better tools to identify people who are going to recover from severe alcoholic hepatitis, and this is a really important issue because there are definitely patients uh, when you start transplanting these people that may get a transplant who otherwise wouldn't have needed one. Uh, so we need better tools to identify patients. Uh, <clears throat> we need uh, long-term relapse and recurrent alcoholic liver disease incidents in the short-term sobriety population. So I've published some short-term data here. 
The French study was about three years follow-up. Uh, there's a study from Mount Sinai in New York with similar results. Again, short-term follow-up. But we need to see what happens with this patient population at five years and at 10 years post-transplant, both in terms of allograft outcome uh, and serious relapse risk. We need better biomarkers to detect the alcohol use post-transplant. And we need trials of prevention strategies. Amazingly enough, there is absolutely nothing in the literature involving using anti-relapse medications like baclofen or acamprosate in the post-transplant population. There's just a dearth of literature in that regard. Uh, I'm really going to briefly talk about hepatocellular carcinoma. So we're going to move away from alcohol, um, talk about liver cancer, and we're going to move past Milan here. And uh, Luis Fernandez talked a little bit about this uh, in his talk, uh, but we've moved beyond the Milan criteria for liver transplantation, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So hepatocellular carcinoma remains a leading indication for liver transplant. Uh, most patients with liver cancer develop it within the context of cirrhosis. The exception to that is hepatitis B, which is becoming less and less frequent in the United States and certainly in our patient population is relatively uncommon. Uh, and then occasionally we'll see somebody develop a tumor in the setting of NASH outside of cirrhosis. But because most patients have cirrhosis, it limits the ability to perform a safe resection. Uh, they just don't have a, a good enough liver and enough remnant liver to uh, do well after a resection. And then there's a risk of a, a recurrence or de novo tumor. So it's a field effect. So it's the effect of the cirrhosis that leads to the tumor generation. If you remove one tumor, the rest of the liver is at risk of developing additional tumors. The original data on transplanting HCC uh, successfully uh, was uh, the group in Italy from Milan who uh, published the Milan criteria. Uh, they had excellent disease-free survival, meaning they were not likely to relapse after transplant to HCC. They had a less than 15% disease recurrence and a five-year survival of about 68 to 70%. Those criteria, for those of you not familiar, you can have one lesion, one HCC between two and five centimeters, or up to three lesions, none of which larger than three in largest diameter. You can't have any macrovascular invasion, so you can't have tumor thrombus in the portal vein or hepatic vein, and you can't have distant uh, metastases. So the, really the first group to kind of push this forward was the group from UCSF, and Louise talked a little bit about uh, US, UCSF criteria, and they pushed this out a little bit more. Uh, they were able to, they w are willing to accept one lesion up to 6.5 centimeters, um, and then two to three lesions no more than 4.5 centimeters with the total tumor burden less than eight centimeters. And using their UCSF criteria, they saw no difference in survival or disease progression. Uh, their prognostic factors for poor outcome were poor differentiation of the tumor, and this has been repeated in numerous studies that poorly differentiated tumors are more likely to recur after transplant. Uh, anybody who has lymphovascular invasion, even microscopically, and then total tumor number was associated with poorer outcomes. Uh, this incorporates uh, the practice now of downstaging into Milan. And what that means is we use local regional therapy uh, to treat patients with tumors outside of Milan to try to push their tumors down into Milan criteria, see if they respond. And when I say uh, local regional therapy, I'm talking about transarterial chemolingualization, so accessing the tumor's blood supply via the hepatic artery and then embolizing it. Uh, using chemotherapy or radio embolization or radiation. Every program who's moving into Milan through downstaging uh, incorporates a period of mandatory observation. Basically, we're trying to see what happens to the tumor when you treat it. You want to see the tumor shrink or ideally go away altogether. You want to make sure they don't addi develop additional tumors or metastasis. Okay, so tumor biology is of uh, quite a bit of importance when it comes to this. To be successful, you need tumors that are not behaving biologically aggressive. This is also known as the ablate and wait strategy. So if you ever hear somebody say that, that's what we're talking about. So this is a single study from a UCSF, uh, downstaging tumors. Uh, this was 122 patients outside of Milan. Again, uh, this is the demographic. So you can see a single lesion less than eight, two to three lesions less than five centimeters with a total diameter less than eight, or four to five lesions less than three centimeters and a total diameter less than eight. Again, you can't have vascular invasion. They're treated with taste or ablation, and that's the ablate part, and then a minimum of three months of observation, the wait time. Uh, successful downstaging was considered when they uh, entered Milan criteria for deceased donors or if they were in UCSF cri uh, criteria for live donors. They considered a fail to downstage if the tumors stayed outside the downstaging criteria or they developed vascular lymph node metastasis. Uh, and the results were uh, no difference uh, in the uh, survival in patients who had T2 or within Milan criteria disease and those downstaged. 
They had some risk factors for dropout, so patients who were less likely to get to transplant were to fail. Uh, that's for those with an alpha feed of protein above 1,000, uh, and those with child's B cirrhosis, with more, more decompensated disease. Nobody in the downstage group had a poorly differentiated HCC on explant. And previously, as I mentioned before, that's been shown to predict recurrence. So again, part of that waiting time is to see poorly differentiated tumors tend to grow quickly, they tend to uh, invade, they tend to go into the portal vein relatively quickly. Uh, this is an article in Press uh, from the uh, Toronto, University of Toronto, uh, and they've been using the extended Toronto criteria uh, for HCC transplantation. Uh, they'll consider anybody with no, with, it doesn't matter their tumor size or the number of uh, tumors that they have, uh, but they do exclude people who have systemic cancer-related symptoms, and I think this is a tough one uh, because certainly patients with end-stage liver disease can have a lot of these symptoms. So these are patients who've lost uh, 10 kilograms, so about 20, 25 pounds. Uh, if they have an Eastern uh, Cooperative Oncology Group score of greater than one over three months, they're getting more declined, or a performance status above zero. So these are generally walking well patients with HCC. Uh, they biopsy all lesions, and they exclude anybody with poorly differentiated tumor. And then obviously, again, you're getting a theme, vascular or extrahepatic metastases is the no-go. Uh, they used RFA, TACE, and then, or, or uh, uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy for bridging. Uh, they did publish this first cohort in 2011. Um, that was the patients who were, had this extended tra uh, Toronto criteria transplant up to 2008, and they saw excellent five-year survival of 70%. This is a validation cohort. So this was 243 patients listed for transplant. Um, so they had 33 patients um, dropped out, uh, and similar between the cohorts were Milan and outside of Milan. Of the 210 patients who underwent transplantation, they had a similar mortality rate, uh, about 26% in the uh, outside Milan criteria group versus 21%, and a similar HCC recurrence, but I would point out that that p-value is getting a little bit close to statistically significant, and at least should raise some antennas, 25% uh, uh, HCC recurrence versus 16%. Uh, they evaluated the effective alpha feed of protein and found that AFP greater than 500 at listing increases the risk of listing dropout. So 40% of the patients with an AFP over 500 or over 500 dropped out and did not get the transplant. Uh, and then those with transplanted with an AFP over 500 an increased risk of mortality after transplant, mostly due to disease recurrence. So alpha feed of protein plays an important role in this process. Um, and this gets to the last point of, of my slide. This will be the last little topic here. Um, and that's the changes in MELD allocation for tumors. Uh, previously, the old model was is that if you had HCC within Milan, uh, you got 22 points were given at listing. And you get a 10% MELD score increase, about three points, every three months, provided there was no evidence of metastatic disease, and there was no MELD cap, meaning you could accumulate points all the way up to 40. The problem with this was is numerous studies were beginning to show that patients were not that high a risk of dropping off the list due to hepatocellular carcinoma. Meanwhile, the risk, mortality risk of having a MELD score from an actual liver disease, liver failure, uh, had it carried a substantial risk of falling off the disease due, or falling off the list due to death. And here's a list here. You can see the HCC patients were much less likely at a, at a comparable MELD score, and that's that MELD exception score, to drop off the wait list versus patients with liver failure. So it was felt that there was an inequity that patients with tumors were given a priority and were more likely to be transplanted even though their risk of dying on the wait list was lower. So this is the new uh, revised HCC exception. So basically, uh, you apply uh, and you get nothing for six months. Okay, so uh, you are kept with your native MELD score. So if your MELD score is eight and you've got tumors, your MELD score is eight for six months. Previously, you would have gone from a 22 to a 25 in that interim. At six months then, you can get a 28, which is the same as you would have gotten before. This again allows for the ablate and wait strategy for the tumor biology to begin to, to pair out over that six month period. Uh, then you go to a 29, 31, 33, and then you apply a cap of 34, okay? And this is actually patients who were initiated before, 2000, or before the new change came in 2015. They're capping them at 34. This goes probably back to the share 35 rule. Uh, where they didn't want patients getting regional allocation priority for HCC um, and taking and organs being shipped back and forth uh, due to HCC. Again, this goes back to the whole point of SHARE35 being transplanting patients who are at high risk of dropping off the wait list. So to summarize the pedocellular carcinoma, uh, some patients outside of Milan criteria will still have excellent outcomes after liver transplantation. Risk factors for poor outcomes include poorly differentiated tumors and an alpha-feta protein above 500. 
Um, while excellent outcomes can be achieved transplanting outside Milan, uh, you know, the current data would suggest that the margin of success is narrow and proper patient selection is crucial uh, for maintaining these outcomes. And this MELD exception for HCC has changed and that remains controversial. Some people are asking whether or not patients with a single lesion that can likely be cured should be considered for liver transplantation if their liver is otherwise good. Um, so I think there'll still be more changes to the HCC allocation policy as we go forward uh, because we don't want to be transplanting patients uh, at low risk of death um, uh, from HCC. And with hepatitis C treatment being successful now, um, a lot of HCC patients have uh, hepatitis C and previously we were like, well, we can't get rid of the hepatitis C. You know, it's probably best just to transplant these people. Well, now, you know, you can treat the tumors, get rid of the hepatitis C. They don't have any ongoing liver damage. So if their MELD score is eight, they have a single lesion, and you get rid of it. Well, that might suffice and save transplantation for those who recur. So my conclusions is that many transplant uh, candidates previously excluded from liver transplantation due to the six-month rule for alcoholic liver disease uh, and Milan criteria for hepatocellular carcinoma can be successfully transplanted with disease-free outcomes similar to the general transplant population. Uh, we need better tools to stratify high-risk populations to maximize donor utility and minimize waitlist mortality. Basically, we want to transplant people who are going to get a good outcome. But, and this is the one potential downside to all of this, is that expansion of the transplantation to a larger population will increase the disparity between recipient need and donor availability. And this goes back to some of the stuff that Luis was talking about, about expanding the criteria of uh, donation after cardiac death to increase the number of donor organs available. Because at least in our experience, there's no shortage of people who would benefit from a liver transplant. Uh, what we're really suffering from is a lack of donors. And that's it. Any questions I can answer for you? Are there any questions for Dr. Rice? thought at UW um, a couple years ago we had a study going where we were looking for a biomarker of alcohol use post-transplant. Do you know whatever happened with that? Yeah, and so it's in publication. Um, and uh, it's, not, um, it's not currently widely available. Um, it's, we were basically part of a clinical trial looking at it, and the, and the sensitivity and specificity are very high. Uh, so I think that it will be a uh, tool that we can use. Uh, it just needs to get its data published and become commercially available and reimbursed. It's a finger stick, so you just got to give it a little drop of blood. Yeah. Is there anything promising on the horizon for HCC? Yeah. So uh, we uh, the question is uh, a new chemotherapeutic agents for HCC. Uh, and we are in, uh, have a clinical trial right now at UW uh, using what they call, I think it's a PD-1 inhibitor. And again, the, the idea is the same, if there's probably most famously in melanoma, um, of called checkpoint inhibition, using the body's immune system to try to fight the tumors. Uh, yes, so there, yes, the answer to that is yes. I think the one potential, um, the one potential um, stumbling block with that is going to be is that, as a general rule, HCC occurs in cirrhosis in the United States, um, and so the underlying liver disease remains a problem. Um, ablative technologies are very, uh, very good. What we do need, though, is that once the disease is metastatic, it's, it's you know, palliative therapy. Uh, and so patients, and we've had patients post-transplant, unfortunately, who relapse with uh, HCC, and for them, there's nothing we can offer that's curative at that point. Um, and so that is definitely a need uh, is... Uh, uh, novel chemotherapeutic agents for, you know, that's across the spectrum of all uh, malignancies uh, for treating patients who uh, fall outside of what we can cure uh, presently. Um, you said between 1 and 6 percent of people that are drinking more heavily develop hepatitis. Are there certain risk factors that make those people more likely to develop it? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the heavier you drink, the dose is the toxin. So the people who drink heavily, um, you know, the, the person who drinks a six-pack a day is less likely to develop cirrhosis than the guy who drinks a pint of liquor a day. 
Uh, and then frequently we see other comorbid diseases. Um, uh, liver disease, you can pickle your liver in any one a number of ways. Uh, the, pr the two big things we see are hepatitis C and NASH. So if you have NASH or risk factors for NASH on top of alcohol, you're more likely to progress to cirrhosis. Similarly, uh, we oftentimes see hepatitis C uh, and alcohol comorbid. If you'd had one or the other, you may very well never have gotten uh, cirrhosis, but the combination of the two uh, pushes you over the edge. Do you have a protocol for cirrhotic patients for imaging for HCC? Uh, so we don't use a protocol as sort of individual. Um, the ASLD uh, and the, uh, uh, in the ESL would recommend a, an ultrasound of the liver every six months with an alpha feta protein. Alpha feta protein is controversial. It's kind of out of flavor. Now it's back in flavor. Uh, it just kind of depends who's writing the guidelines. But anyway, um, so the, the, the standard is ultrasound every six months. Um, The caveat to that is a lot of those studies have been done um, in Asian populations with hepatitis B, um, which they're generally uh, more trim. Um, and hepatitis B screening is often done, done outside of the setting of cirrhosis where the liver is not so heterogeneous. Uh, that being said, um, there's been some modeling studies that have shown that there really wouldn't be a big difference between using CT or MRI as screening. And from a cost-effective standpoint, you have to ask uh, if that's really cost-effective in the long run to be doing CTs or MRI scans every six months. Um, also, I will say that you also decrease the specificity so you find things on MRI and CT scan that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise that don't turn out to be anything. So it's still in evolution, and it, there's, a lot of it is practice-specific, but our official guidelines are ultrasound with alpha protein every six months. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Rice. It was an excellent presentation. We're going to head to the exhibit hall for lunch. Uh, don't forget to gather your tickets from the exhibitors and uh, put them in for the drawing after the break this afternoon. And we'll reconvene at 1.15.